15 minute or less lecture series anatomy and physiology chapter 15 digestive system and nutrition part one so digestion refers to mechanical and chemical breakdown of foods so that includes chopping it up with your teeth into small and smaller pieces as well as breaking down the very large compounds into uh, chemicals into smaller ones so like breaking down uh, a protein into amino acids uh, the alimentary canal is the entire tube going from your mouth all the way to your anus. It measures approximately 8 meters. So it starts with the oral cavity, goes through the pharynx, the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestine, the large intestine, the rectum, and then finally out the anus. Uh, the uh, Most of the alimentary canal is a muscular tube. Uh, this muscular tube has four primary layers. The innermost layer is the mucosa. It is an epithelium lining a uh, layer made up of epithelial tissue followed by some connective tissue. It helps to uh, protect uh, tissues further deep into the uh, alimentary canal as well as to provide secretion and absorption of uh, various materials. And sometimes it has various folds that project into the lumen or open space. Uh, then you have the submucosa layer. The submucosa layer is primarily connective tissue. It includes a lot of nerves as well as lymph vessels and blood vessels and it's basically providing nourishment for the organ itself as well as also um, nervous system control then you have the muscular layer this is made of two layers of smooth muscle tissue the inner circular fibers and the outer longitudinal fibers these are helpful because they help to propel the food through the canal and finally the outermost layer is the serosa um, often serosa is also the visceral layer of the peritoneum and this helps to hold the structure in place and it helps provide protection to the various tissues of the alimentary canal and of course if it is part of the visceral peritoneum then also secretes serous fluid that goes into the uh, cavity within the peritoneum. So here's an example of um, a cross section of the small intestine. So again, you have the mucosa layer. In this case, it's modified to include these folds that project out into the lumen. Uh, the submucosa layer with the lymphatic vessels, blood vessels, nerves, and so forth. Uh, the muscular layer, the two layers of smooth muscle tissue, and the serosa. Peritoneum is a large serous membrane. It has five main regions. It is important for both protecting the various organs of the diet. Uh, alimentary canal because they are always moving and rubbing up against things that helps protect them from friction. It also acts as an attachment site so it helps to attach uh, structures to the abdominal walls and or to other organs. Uh, there are two types of movement that occur in the alimentary canal. There's the mixing movement that is basically allowing the materials to get mixed up further. So segmentation is an example in the small uh, intestine where uh, it'll squeeze uh, rhythmically back and forth, back and forth, causing the materials to mix together more um, thoroughly. And then propelling movements onwards, peristalsis, so that there's a contraction behind the food that acts as a way of pushing it along the canal. All right, the beginning of the alimentary canal, the oral cavity of the mouth. This is the interway for food. Mastication occurs here, so mechanical digestion and also a limited amount of chemical digestion. The oral cavity is specifically the space between the palate and the tongue. So if we look at the mouth, obviously we have the cheeks, the lateral walls of the oral cavity, helpful for facial expressions and moving the food around a little bit when you're chewing. The lips, very mobile structures, very sensitive to judging food temperature and texture. Uh, we have the tongue, a very muscular organ uh, made up of skeletal muscles. Uh, it is covered by a mucous membrane. It has various papillae which allow for taste sensation. Uh, gustation as well as the bright friction so the tongue can move materials around. Uh, you have the lingual tonsils at the very base of the tongue. These are lymphatic tissues that help to protect us from any pathogens that manage to absorb through the oral cavity into our body. Uh, the palate, you have the hard palate. The hard palate or roof of the mouth is uh, made up partially of bone, actual bones, and then the soft palate is just connective tissue and muscular tissue. And then hanging off the very end of the back of the throat is the uvula. The uvula and the soft palate are important because they help to block the nasal cavity with swallowing so that food and material doesn't go up into the nasal cavity. Uh, we have some tonsils, the pharyngeal tonsil, 
in the back of the nasopharynx, the palatine tonsils at the very um, border between the pharynx and the oral cavity, and of course, as I already mentioned, the lingual tonsils. Uh, teeth are found in the mouth, very important. They are um, held within the maxillary bones or the mandibular bone. Uh, we get developed two sets of teeth in our lifetime, 20 primary teeth that are shed as we get older to give us the 32 secondary teeth. Uh, teeth are important for mechanical digestion, breaking things down. We see we have the incisors, four incisors, the canine, two canine per top or bottom. So on the top, four incisors, two canine, uh, four premolars, and then six molars. Um, if you look at a tooth, the top region that is above the gum line, that is the crown of the tooth. The lower region that goes into the bone, that is the root of the tooth. Uh, the root of the tooth is attached to the surrounding bone by the periodontal ligament. You can also look at the tooth in layers. The outermost layer is the enamel. This is actually the hardest substance our body produces. Uh, under that would be the dentin, which makes up the bulk of the tooth. And then from there is the pulp, or the really sensitive portion of the tooth, where you have blood vessels and nerves. Salivary glands. There are six salivary glands, three pairs uh, of salivary glands. They have the saliva they produce helps to moisten food, helps to dissolve it a little bit. It helps us to taste the food, keep the mouth cleansed, and also begins the chemical digestion of uh, carbohydrates via the salivary amylase enzyme. Uh, the salivary am, uh, amylase basically is there to break down carbs. Uh, salivary Fluid is primarily water and there's some mucus and it receives stimulation by the parasympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system in order to produce saliva, um, often by the sight or smell of food, but also by having food in your mouth that you start to chew. Uh, so we have the parotid glands that are near the ear. They produce a, a very clear fluid with lots of amylase. We have the submandibular glands that are underneath the mandible on the root floor of the mouth, and they secrete a slightly more viscous saliva, and then the sublingual glands that are directly under the tongue, and their saliva is the thickest with a lot of mucus in it. Uh, pharynx, or throat, as we know, it has three regions, nasopharynx, oropharynx, or laryngopharynx. Ideally, we're only using the oropharynx and laryngopharynx to connect to the esophagus. That's its role, is during the swallowing process or deglutination, the food travels to the esophagus, not the larynx or nasal cavity. Uh, three stages to the swallowing reflex. First, the chewed up food is now called a bolus, and you force it toward the back of your uh, oral cavity. Then uh, that'll pass a certain point where the swallowing reflex will initiate, causing the soft palate nuclei to rise to block the nasal cavity. Hyoid bone and larynx will elevate so the epiglottis can cover the opening to the larynx, and then the pharyngeal muscles will push the bolus down into the esophagus. Uh, then the uh, esophagus will go through the process of peristalsis to move that bolus down to the stomach. So again, a series of con muscular contractions behind the bolus, sending it downward to the uh, esophag uh, stomach, and gravity is not involved. So the esophagus, a collapsible tube, the first part of the uh, alimentary canal, that's that muscular tube, tube I talked about earlier. Uh, it has many mucus glands to help moisten and lubricate its inner lining to help that movement of the bolus downwards. And it ends with the lower esophageal sphincter that prevents contents of the stomach from going back up into the esophagus. Gastroesophageal reflux disease is when that uh, sphincter doesn't work properly and the acids from the stomach start to damage the esophagus. Stomach, J-shaped soft muscular organ, sort of a pouch along the alimentary canal. It receives and mixes food with gastric juices and then propels it into the small intestine. It has lots of little folds called rugi uh, that are projections of the mucosa and submucosal layers. And this also helps the stomach to stretch so it can hold large quantities of food. Uh, the stomach, by region, you have the cardia just directly after the esophagus. You have the fundus or hump of the stomach. Most of it is the body of the stomach. And then it ends in the pylorus that finally leads to the pyloric sphincter that controls the movement of materials to the small intestine. Uh, the stomach has many gastric glands that are going to secrete the uh, gastric uh, fluids. The three main kinds of secretory cells include the mucosa cells that produce mucus, the chief cells that produce uh, pepsinogen, which is an inactive enzyme. It becomes active in an acidic environment, then becomes pepsin, and this will break down proteins. 
the parietal cells that produce the hydrochloric acid and fluid of the gastric juice, and it all combines in the stomach. Uh, so stomach regulation, uh, basically gastric secretions are enhanced by the parasympathetic impulses, as well as the hormone gastrin, which is produced by the gastric pits. So the stomach tells itself to get really active by producing its own hormones to stimulate itself. Uh, as the stomach mixes the bolus of the gastric juices, it becomes a liquid slurry called chyme. Um, the amount of time stuff remains in the stomach varies. Fats tend to stay in there a lot longer, three to six hours, while proteins and high carbohydrates will pass more quickly. Um, when the food leaves the stomach, it will enter the duodenum of the small intestine, and this will lead to secretion inhibition of the uh, uh, secretion of um, enzymes as well as the autonomic nervous system causing the stomach to become more inhibited so it doesn't secrete more gastric juice. And it also slowed down gastric mobility by the release of the hormone cholecystokinin. All right, the duodenum is the first part of the small intestine. As it fills with chyme, it will send out signals to receive secretions from the du uh, accessory organs, the pancreas, the liver, and the gallbladder. The pancreas, as we see here, is found in the superior left abdominal quadrant. Uh, it will then secrete the pancreatic juice through the pancreatic duct, and this will include a lot of enzymes uh, and pancreatic amylase for breaking down carbohydrates, pancreatic lipase for fats, two nucleases for nucleic acids, trypsin, chymotrypsin, and carbohydrate for proteins, and also bicarbonate fluid to neutralize the gastric juice. So most chemical digestion occurs in the small intestine. Um, it also releases the hormone cholocystokinin that stimulates the release of the gastric juice, as well as inhibiting the stomach, um, and it releases these hormones when the uh, duodenum gets, begins to stretch. It also releases the hormone secretin that stimulates the release of the gas uh, pancreatic juice. So it has two different hormones causing it to secrete what it needs to in response to the presence of chyme. Um, so again, gastric contents enter. Uh, uh, this causes secretin to release into the bloodstream, goes to the pancreas, causing the pancreas to release the bicarbonate ions to neutralize the acid. Uh, the liver, reddish brown, in the upper right quadrant of the abdominal cavity. Um, it has four lobes the um, right lobe, the left lobe, quadrate lobe, and the caudate lobe. It receives blood from the hepatic artery as well as from the hepatic portal vein. That vein is carrying nutrient rich uh, blood to the liver. Um, it has various lo lobules, uh, hepatic lobules, that uh, radiate out, and in their corners are the central veins that will eventually carry the blood out of the. Uh, um, as the rich blood and oxygenated blood reaches the liver, there are cooper cells to destroy any pathogens. The liver will then remove and store specific nutrients. Uh, the liver also produces bile that gets collected in the bile caniculi. The bile caniculi then connect up to the common hepatic duct. It also connects to the cystic duct, and these finally lead to the common bile duct to carry bile to the duodenum. Uh, so it has a lot of functions. The liver does many metabolic activities, synthesizes cholesterol, converts carbohydrates and proteins to fat, stores uh, vitamin A, glucose, etc., filters the blood, removes damaged blood cells, produces blood plasma, and produces bile. Uh, bile is a pigment with cholesterol and bile pigments. It helps to break down. It is from the breakdown of hemoglobin, and it helps to also to get rid of excess cholesterol. Um, it helps in mechanical digestion because it emulsifies fats. It causes big fat globules to become teeny tiny globules, making them more uh, able to be broken down by uh, lipases. Uh, the gallbladder stores bile and then releases it when necessary through the cystic duct that then joins up the common bile duct. Uh, the gallbladder is kind of a pearl shaped organ, and again, the common bile duct will eventually connect to the pancreatic duct as they secrete their substances into the duodenum. Uh, the gallbladder is stimulated by the cholecystokinin hormone. Uh, so again, the hormone goes into the bloodstream and stimulates the gallbladder to constrict to release its bile. And that's it for this part of the lecture.